Welcome everybody to today's session. Uh, we'll get started in about five minutes, uh, three minutes. Welcome everyone to today's session. We will get started in about two minutes. Hello everyone, thank you for coming to today's session. We will be starting in about a minute. All right. It... Okay, it looks like it's about time. So um, good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is where you are. Uh, and thank you so much for joining um, us for today's webinar. My name is Billy Cotterman, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available for later viewing after the conference. Um, please change your chat settings from all panelists to all panelists and attendees if you would like everybody to see your comments. Um, please use the Q&A feature um, for any presentation questions. You can use the Q&A to submit anonymous questions too. Um, there will be 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers following the presentation. Um, please use the chat for general comments or technical issues. Anne and Reno will be monitoring the chat for any questions and comments. And then finally, please abide by the code of conduct, which can be found here. All right. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to our presenters. All right, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And I just wanted to say again, thank you to the conference organizers and to Rinna, Ann, and Billy, who are with us today. Uh, as we were talking about before the session, this is the most support I feel like I've ever had as a presenter for a conference. So I cannot express enough gratitude. Um, and thanks for all of you all for being here. I know there are multiple other intriguing sessions right now. So we appreciate you all are spending some time with us and talking about um, our topic for the day. So I am going to go ahead and share my presentation here.
Okay, so back to our topic for the day, elevating through agency, uh, middle manager advocacy for direct reports. So we'll introduce ourselves to you first and then just jump right in. My name is Rebecca Miller Waltz. I am the head of library learning services at Penn State University Libraries, um, located at our University Park campus, which is directly in the middle of central Pennsylvania. Uh, and I will hand it over to Cynthia to tell you a little bit more about herself. Hello, uh, my name is Cynthia Hudson Vitali. I'm currently the Director of Scholars and Scholarship with the Association of Research Libraries. Um, prior to that, uh, most recently as last December, I was the Head of Research Informatics and Publishing at Penn State University Libraries, also and still within uh, Center County State College, Pennsylvania, and passing it along to Steve. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Borelli. I'm the head of library assessment and I'm also at the University Park campus in Center County in Happy Valley. Um, and this is my buddy Wilson, he's gonna be presenting with me today. Um, and I'll pass it back over to Rebecca. Thank you. And as always, super excited to have Wilson presenting with us. Wilson is a Penn State superstar. Um, so he has graced us with his presence today, which is always exciting. All right. So all of us presenters have been encouraged to share a land acknowledgement um, as part of our presentation. So our land acknowledgement is going to look a little bit different. Um, we acknowledge that there is a lot to acknowledge when we talk about land acknowledgement. Um, the Native Governance Center, which I've linked here, offers some tips on doing this. And as I read through those, I took to heart really thinking about the self-reflection they encourage, the doing the homework part that they encourage and using the appropriate language. Uh, they also do suggest that there are many different ways to acknowledge the land and that discomfort is and should be part of the process. I certainly found this as we started thinking about doing our homework for this particular land acknowledgement. We discovered that at Penn State, although a number of people are discussing this and thinking about the appropriate language to use for our land and for our relationships with the land, um, there is currently no agreed upon language for land, acknowledge, land acknowledgements at Penn State, um, that there are different opinions and interpretations and that collectively across the university and across the Commonwealth, we are working to better understand the relationship of the land and the people. And so for that reason, I offer these resources that I have on this slide. Um, in particular, I have found the Land Grab University's website really interesting and instructive as it explains how the United States funded land grant universities um, with expropriated indigenous land sort of came to be. Um, I've also linked here a digital component of the Penn State Library's Special Collections Library recent exhibit um, on indigenous roots. roots. And then I have to, here two additional guides um, to creating a land acknowledgement. So what this ends up looking like for us is sort of a start to a land acknowledgement. So while this is not a full statement, um, we offer the beginning here. The statement is taken from the Indigenous Roots Roots exhibit page uh, linked on the previous slide. But as I started engaging some of these conversations, we, we recognized that there are actually over 112 additional tribes that the PSU land grant was taken from. So again, I offer a statement here, but really knowing that it's reflective of a commitment to learning more building relationships and doing the work to truly acknowledge the land. And before we totally jump into our presentation, a quick disclaimer. Our story that we're about to tell you is not a story about success. This is not a success story, but it's a story about the agency that we found in the role of middle management um, through seeking out help in order to improve morale for ourselves, for our colleagues, and for our direct reports. So a little bit about the background of the project that we are sharing with you today we're going to be talking about a renovation project at Penn State Libraries and what that meant for a number of our colleagues. The renovations that we're talking about were part of a plan called Libraries 2020, which actually sounds rather ominous now to talk about Libraries 2020. Um, but these renovations had been planned for over 15 years. 
So the two spaces we're going to be talking about um, were previous outside courtyard spaces that were filled in to create office spaces for two departments, the Library Learning Services Department and the Research Informatics and Publishing Department. These two departments were very different in terms of orientation, in terms of history. Library Learning Services had been a department within the libraries at Penn State for over 20 years. I joined Penn State Libraries in 2015. Um, so I, I've actually only worked with this department for a small percentage of the time that it's existed. Um, and the department has really grown over that period of time. Research Informatics and Publishing was a totally new department. Cynthia, as the head, joined Penn State Libraries in 2018 um, when designs were nearly complete for the office space. So sort of two different experiences, two different departments going through the same types of change, which were that our departments would be moving into these new office spaces that were being built with the caveat that these office spaces were going to be open office spaces as in no one would get private offices. So while there are clearly a lot of challenges that might come with the type of change um, that moving into a new type of office space would result, particularly for two departments that had very different histories and experiences, um, during the two-year planning process, a number of other challenges disrupted this process. The two associate deans that these departments reported through turned over during the design and planning process, meaning that the two associate deans who started the planning for these new spaces left into new associate deans and stepped into these roles. Libraries wide space planning processes and personnel changed during this period of time as well, and uh, an overarching space steering committee emerged as part of this process or in the middle of this process rather. So communication processes changed. Um, and because of some of the turnover in leadership, communication was also a bit difficult and a challenge. Um, some of the other components and challenges as part of this overall process, it was really the organizational culture surrounding the idea of office space that made this transition difficult. Um, office space in many ways was considered a value and a currency within our organization, which is probably likely the case at many of your organizations as well. Um, so even as we planned for and thought through what these changes might mean, there was already sort of an affective or emotional impact um, that was part of this change. Even colleagues who were not in our departments and who were not directly affected by these changes were concerned and vocal about the situation. So sort of a lot of organizational culture almost chaos sort of going on there. Um, and as we're thinking about what some of these challenges were as the design and planning process happened for these new spaces, one of the biggest considerations was that there were real space restrictions. There were only so many offices that existed, so much space that existed within our libraries at the University Park campus. And um, each of these two departments, Library Learning Services and Research Informatics and Publishing kept growing. So we needed a solution for the colleagues that were joining us to do the work that we needed to do. Um, and one that wouldn't necessarily rely on the number of existing office spaces. So that was sort of a very shallow brief and um, sort of summary of the challenge that we found ourselves in as Cynthia and I, as the two department heads here, move toward transitioning our departments into open office spaces. So we wanna show you a little bit about what these spaces looked like. Um, so the spaces, as I mentioned before, were in filled in courtyard areas. And so the library learning services department was on the second floor, research informatics and publishing was on the third floor. So we're gonna show you um, the floor plans and then some photos of what these spaces ended up looking like. And then we're going to talk about um, what the reactions and results actually were. So you can see here that this space was developed for 12 people. And um, you can sort of see there are two banks of six seats here with some additional focus room spaces around the edges of the office. 
And what this ended up looking like, this is outside the office space. You can see the door going into our office space. And then there is some informal seating right outside the office space as well. Inside the office space on the photo on the left, you can see those banks of seats. And then on the right over here, um, you can see some of the focus rooms, which were originally intended for small group meetings for two to three people. Um, but we will see, we'll talk a little bit later in the presentation about what things are going to look like as we return to work post COVID. So I'm gonna bounce over now to the floor plan for research informatics and publishing. Um, Cynthia, did you wanna talk through this one? Yes, thank you. Um, so research informatics and publishing uh, is set up a little bit differently than uh, library learning services. It's the same courtyard um, location, but you'll you'll notice um, there's a hallway kind of to the to the north of the the office space, and then there's about three distinct spaces. Um, the entryway into the office is directly within the workspace, and then we have three focus rooms within the, the actual room. We have a digital lab that's open to the public that's right in the middle of our of the space that we um, operate and that we uh, prov like provide workshops and training out of. And then we have a more casual area for gathering. So the this space uh, brought 10 of the team members together, but there was still two other distributed um, department mem uh, department teams that were located throughout the library. So a, a common area for us all to hold meetings was was kind of key. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see how oh wrong way. Yep. Um, so you can see the first image on the left is that hallway um, along with the bank of windows that um, that both of our spaces included. And then the second image you see is how uh, actually the, the former outside wall of one of the buildings. And so that was now our inside wall. And we actually looked out into um, a, a, a giant reading room. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just uh, on the left, you'll see an example of what the, the um, seating area looks like, or excuse me, the um, office space looks like, and then some of the, the gathering space as well. Next slide, please. So um, the resulting um, feedback and reactions from these, uh, we found em the employee experiences in their prior work environment strongly shaped their initial reaction to the new space. Those moving from private offices, which um, included many LLS employees, um, expressed kind of what we found or what we found later was that it, they expressed kind of greater concern about adjusting to an environment where their work area was open to others. So, you know, we heard that um, the space was smaller than they expected, um, way more open and just windows on every slide or on every side. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Additionally, um, most Repub employees, including myself, had worked in open office spaces before. So um, we, we shared strategies and um, you know, we, we had some common experiences to draw upon um, in which to uh, kind of make adjustments to our, our work life um, if, if we needed to do so. But um, you know, there was uh, feedback that uh, folks had strategies in place for working with it. And finally, the last, um, next slide, please. The lax um, reaction that I, we wanted to share was, um, it also felt like the initial reactions that we received were influenced by the level of input employees had during the design and renovation stage. Um, I think um, Rebecca mentioned it, but since I joined kind of very late in the design phase, the, the entire department, which was brand new, didn't have a lot of input into what should go into that space. Um, whereas library learning services actually went through a very um, in-depth uh, and participatory uh, discussions with uh, designers and others on furniture they wanted in the space, details and list of options and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so that was, um, that was, that was uh, often a point of uh, reflection as well, seeing how things translated from images into actual 
um, into actual uh, real life. So I am going to turn this back over to Rebecca. Thanks, Cynthia. All right, so we probably could have spent the whole hour just talking about moving into open office spaces, what the change management process for our teams looked like, our opinions on office spaces in general. But this case study, this scenario itself, what actually happened here is not as important as the piece that we're trying to pull from it, which is what happens when, as a middle manager, you are in a situation where your entire department might be experiencing what we now know could be a low morale experience. And so this little piece here is plucked from uh, Katrina Davis Kendrick's uh, research on the low morale experience of academic librarians. And um, this piece, which we got to hear quite a lot more about during the keynote on Monday, um, which was fantastic, uh, really points to what useful and not so useful leadership can look like here. The article, of course, really focuses on analyzing what what a low morale experience means and why why people might be experiencing it. Um, and it specifically does not try to develop strategies for dealing with that. Um, the themes that were identified, though, as as what a low morale experience might be um, and what we know about the sorts of experiences, people and systems that negatively impact morale, uh, we were able to identify that our office situation and many of these complicating factors around it um, really did reflect some of these low morale themes from the research. So our question was, what does acknowledging and taking responsibility for improving workplace morale look like from the middle where we sit? There are some things we have control over. There's a lot that we don't have control over, but what can we do to acknowledge and try to improve morale at this point? So we're going to move into actually talking about what our strategy is for advocacy um, and improving morale really looked like for us. So it was really important that we sought help and expertise from others who could help us um, really address the concerns that we were hearing from our colleagues. One of the themes of low morale for library employees is that they don't feel listened to. Um, there could be a negligence piece there. And we did not want to contribute to that negligence. We wanted to listen to the concerns that our colleagues had and figure out a way to not only hear the concerns, but to do something with them. And so we identified four areas where we could try to move forward on the concerns that we were hearing from our colleagues. Uh, those four areas of concerns were around change management, so around culture, around productivity, around collaboration, um, what this move meant for each of our departments. Accessibility was another big concern, accessibility of the physical space, um, environmental health and safety, and then overall assessment of impact and productivity. So while Cynthia and I have expertise in lots of areas. None of these areas are areas of expertise. So we did end up seeking out help um, from people around campus and within the libraries who could help us with this. All right, so looking at change management. Um, while moving into a new office space with so many emotional and practical considerations, um, we really wanted to be sure to proactively manage this change within our departments. The move would change our relationships, the way we work with each other, the type of work that we do, the way we do that work. Some of that would be good. Some of it may be a little more anxiety inducing. We reached out to our human resources officer who connected us with training resources within the university's human resources. And we connected with a university contractor who collaborated with us to develop a custom change management workshop, which we were able to facilitate the week before we moved into the new space. The workshop helped us surface concerns and anxieties and really helped us engage in activities where we identified uh, what we did have control over in terms of how we would be reacting to that space. The workshop also helped us consider our increasingly tumultuous relationship with uh, our administrative leaders, but also helped us understand where they might be coming from. And that's this image that I have here on this slide. One of the things that the Library Learning Services Department really took from this workshop was that while 
we were in this endings phase where we know there's a change coming. We know we need to let go of the old way. Um, we're still struggling with that end piece there. Whereas a lot of the leadership that we were working with were already in the beginnings phase. They're already thinking about what our new roles would be, what the new workflows would look like, what our new purpose would be. And so thinking about those two different perspectives really helped us bridge the gap in some ways um, in terms of working with our leadership and understanding the perspective they might be bringing to this experience, which felt a little bit different than ours. The next consideration was accessibility. Um, at least one colleague within our departments needed to request a reasonable accommodation for the physical space. Um, so after some discussions inside the libraries, we realized that we needed to work with Penn State's educational equity offices, which we started to do in spring 2019 in order to address the need um, for this reasonable accommodation in the design process. The support that we were able to get from this office included funding for the accommodation that needed to be made, um, expertise in integrating accessibility design into the process. And I think that will be something that will be leveraged in the future as well in future design processes. Um, and then the negotiation aspect with libraries, administration, and architects to make sure that this accessibility need and this reasonable accommodation um, were honored and were respected and taken care of. Great. Um, so the next intervention we really worked on was um, looking at environmental health and safety. So um, obviously, uh, moving into the space, protecting the safety of our teams is, is a high priority. Um, and we could see the spaces were set up with few fire or lockable doors. Um, as was seen as well, that the space was very, very open. And we had heard um, anecdotally and directly from many team members, there was concern about um, safety. Um, so in November of 2019, we reached out to the Penn State University Police and Public Services to learn if they could provide a customized workshop on health and safety for open office environments. Uh, we settled on a two-part workshop. The first comprised of a presentation um, primarily focused on the run, fight, hide method. And the second part was a physical walkthrough of the space with the officer on ways to like low hanging fruit or, or ways we can improve uh, incrementally the space uh, to make the, the team members feel more safe and to be more safe. Um, in the walkthroughs, the officer highlighted um, ways in which we could switch the locks to inside the doors so we could control better who could come into the space, ways to add blinds um, in certain points um, uh, to the glass so that we could obscure visibility. Um, and then uh, also he suggested that we create um, department escape plans for unexpected emergencies such as fires and uh, attackers. Um, so in, in LLS, uh, uh, all areas were fairly visible, as you could see in the images. Um, so, so hiding is unfortunately kind of a, a challenge in there, as the officer pointed out. In the repub space, there was only, there's one small focus room where it would be possible to, to hide or to um, get uh, some space or, or protection. Um, so we would have to fit 11 adults and any students at, at that point. Um, from this session, we also had interest from our colleagues in the department to take some self-defense classes that were offered through the police department. And these are being scheduled in April of 2020 before everything went remote. Um, from this workshop, Rebecca and I worked together to create a list of easy enhancements to the spaces to improve safety. And these had been submitted to our administration and were awaiting approval, but we had heard that they were, they were moving along um, when the university went remote. Uh, as I said, we were hearing positive feedback, um, especially on the interior locks and blinds. Um, and many of us, uh, well, in Repub we did, and I think you were working on yours in LLS, uh, created an emergency escape plan. Um, needless to say, while all of this was good and was progress, um, we could still see and hear from our teams that there was some, that they were anxious um, and kind of, maybe not anxious is the right word, but there was still, we were still working through this process that Rebecca um, described as uh, kind of um, 
like the transition process um, before we actually get to the beginnings. Um, and so it was at this time um, that we uh, that we reached out to our colleague, Steve uh, Borelli, who is the head of assessment, about conducting a series of interviews with both of our teams um, to discuss the space and help us develop a set of recommendations for both enhancing the existing space um, and also making any recommendations for any open office spaces the libraries um, might want to uh, develop in the future. So now I'm going to turn it over to him to tell you more about the report. Thanks, Cynthia. So I started on the space steering committee well, well after this process had started. And, and this is the group that identifies and prioritizes renovations. And then apparently the way it works is that once those are determined, we pull a department head in, say, figure out what you need, write a program plan, and we connect them with a designer. But in all seriousness, um, the, the approach of placing responsibility for the design on the stakeholders puts a lot of responsibility for the success of that design on the unit head. They have to lead discussions, develop program plans, and they also act as the primary advocate to address challenges along the way. And that's a legitimate challenge because space design is kind of outside the domain of most of us in the libraries. Um, I don't know about you, but I didn't take any renovation design courses in graduate school. So as the renovation uh, process was progressing, I, I was hearing about some of the struggles and the frustrations of getting reasonable accommodation and concerns like working in a fishbowl with little to no privacy or uh, the lack of established evacuation plans. And so around the time both units were ready to move into their new spaces, we started to meet to discuss how we could come together to improve the situation by, uh, for everyone by doing a study that would provide a third party objective perspective. This is around September, 2019. And, and, and I, we were meeting for lunch and I had asked both Cynthia and, and Rebecca to, to give some thought and, and come, to, come, with, come to the meeting with some ideas for what they wanted to accomplish with the collaboration. Um, and, and they did. They're, he said two pros, right? They, um, they, I think they even had them written down. Uh, so what Cynthia wanted was um, she wanted support for further investment in departmental spaces optimized to support the productivity and collaborative goals the spaces were designed to support. And Rebecca wanted low cost improvements for space or practice that can improve the workability of the space and implemented quickly. So really they're both asking for the same thing. They both wanted evidence that indicated con a continued need for post occupancy funding to refine and optimize the spaces after living in them. And they also wanted to investigate how working in an open office environment impacts the sense of self relative to the university libraries. And to be honest, initially, this one kind of put me on my heels. Um, I, was, I was reluctant. I, I felt like this was out of scope for improving the spaces. And so I was uh, reluctant to in include it in the investigation. And then I went back and I sat down with my research partner, Lana Munip, and we talked it over. And she really showed me how, the importance of, of of investigating the sense of self, including that in this investigation. I'm glad we did because we, we, we found uh, we had a number of good findings. And, and so together we came up with um, these research questions, uh, areas of focus. Slides, please. Okay, so we had two sets of goals. The first aimed at improving the work environment. We wanted to investigate the day-to-day -day work experiences of LLS and Repub personnel and we wanted to identify the benefits and challenges of working in these open office environments. And we wanted to do that through the lens of a faculty senate report, which recommended some guiding principles for new spaces. So around this time, um, faculty moving from private to open spaces was a, a real hot topic at University Park. Um, there was faculty in another college, I think it was education, they were you know, similarly upset, really kind of up in arms when they learned that their new spaces wouldn't be private. And this made it all the way to the Senate and the Senate didn't just listen, but they took some action. Um, they, they responded by drafting an advisory report that identified a few areas which new spaces should accommodate. Um, just quickly, those were security, technology, privacy, and community. I'll talk more about these in a little bit. We also wanted to identify agreements or differences and perceptions between personnel and departmental leadership. Um, the, the people who were gonna work in these spaces, they, they weren't feeling like their voices were heard throughout the process. Um, the new spaces that resulted were really not what was promised early on. Um, so I was concerned that there might be some animosity with, with their unit leadership or opposition to the way they were leading the renovations. Again, so much gets put on the unit leaders in the way we, we approach this. Um, ultimately, this turned out not to be an issue. Uh, instead of opposition, we found mostly aligned perspectives. And, and a lot of the participants acknowledged the, Cynthia and Rebecca's efforts in leading and the challenges they faced. 
We also wanted to investigate how working in an open office environment impacts a sense of self relative to university libraries, um, right, as I mentioned. So to this point, librarians at University Park typically had individual private offices. Um, there are only a handful of us who worked in cubes or other open office spaces. So this was really a culture shift. Uh, we also wanted to provide uh, um, colleagues in a new environment opportunity to share their experiences in the new space with an eye toward improving the practice further. Right. Again, this is this is the group of stakeholders who, to this point in the process, felt like their input wasn't honored. So we wanted to give them a safe and anonymous outlet to provide some feedback and maybe vent a little bit in a less political way. We really wanted them to feel free opening up. And then the next set of goals was really aimed at improving the process for future innovations. We wanted to better equip stakeholders for success, and we wanted to improve equity in space decisions going forward. Slide, please. So a few background considerations. Um, we didn't start this investigation until people had been working in the new spaces for about six months. And we did this because we wanted what we put forward to be meaningful. So we deliberately held off on the investigation until people had time to get comfortable in the space, move past their initial reactions, develop some strategies for working in the open, open environments, and, and to really to experience the opportunities and the constraints that the space has provided. We also knew that if we dove in immediately without time to acclimate, we, we likely get um, a response that people just needed time to adjust and further reluctance to, to invest further in these spaces. And as our participants were the set of stakeholders with the least agency throughout this, um, and, and they felt their input wasn't valued, they were really relying on Rebecca and, and Cynthia, whose, whose agency was also somewhat limited, otherwise they wouldn't have gone to the extent of developing a research study uh, to strengthen their case, right, on top of everything else they've done. Um, so really, this is kind of like, a, this is a story about two leaders who had to walk this line and try to make the best out of a less than optimal situation. And we're kind of getting criticized on both ends, right? Administrators were frustrated with uh, complaints about the space and requests for funding to improve them further. And the direct reports who felt slighted by their new spaces because they weren't what was promised. So we're, we, we tried to be considerate and deliberate in our process. And we wanted to be as transparent as we could in part by providing clear processes for input, review, and feedback. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. But our participants had the interview questions well ahead of the meeting. They saw, um, excuse me, well ahead of meeting for the interviews. They saw the draft report even before Cynthia and Rebecca did. Um, earlier, I mentioned um, a faculty senate report. And our, our interview protocol was informed by this faculty senate discussion and report. And, Guidance from the University on Faculty Spaces had last been updated in 2002, and it really didn't provide, didn't address anything about private versus open spaces. The, the document was simply a table that recommended the maximum size and square feet for an office based on rank, right? So I think it was an emeritus faculty member maybe could have a maximum of 220 feet versus an associate 180, something like that. Now, this 2020 Faculty Senate report on, on office space standards didn't update that 2002 guidance, but it did provide a guide, it, excuse me, it did provide guiding principles for faculty spaces. And the key question that drove the report was, do the departmental spaces meet the core needs of the personnel working within them? And it considered those four areas that I mentioned earlier by asking questions like, are the spaces secure? Do they afford privacy? Do they meet technology needs? And do they support community? And in cases where we felt they didn't meet those needs, what modifications could, could be made in order to improve the work environment? And then after completing the investigation, we started looking at space evaluation tools and ultimately landed on recommending a customized version of this year's building and use assessment. This is something that came out around 2005. Building and use is an evolution to post-occupancy evaluation and building performance evaluation. And it builds on these approaches by considering a wider range of influencing factors. It includes social and physical considerations to evaluate functional comfort. And we thought this was a, a, a pretty well-aligned approach with what the Senate was suggesting as it integrates elements of community, one of the four areas suggested in their report. Slide, please. So our approach, um, we invited everyone who worked in these two spaces to participate in interviews. We developed a 19 question protocol and we shared it ahead of time with anyone who was interested. And then the two of us, Lana and I, conducted one hour interviews with 18 of the 20 uh, people from both departments, including the heads in um, early spring 2020. Now, we were just about done with these when we were all sent home to work remotely. Um, so I think maybe one or two of these interviews happened remotely. Slide, please. So we drafted a report. We ended up 
having two sets of recommendations, uh, which included 12 for improving the LLS and repub spaces specifically, and another eight recommendations for future space planning efforts. We deliberately designed opportunity for all personnel working in these spaces to be interviewed, to have opportunity to review the draft before we shared with Rebecca and Cynthia out of concerns for privacy. This, this protocol provided ample opportunity for them to criticize their unit leaders. And the units are small enough that concerns that were being identified were certainly legitimate. Um, as I mentioned, that, that really didn't happen though. Instead, what we saw was a lot of support for the efforts that Cynthia and Rebecca were making in, in trying to improve the workability of the spaces. And then after a wider review, um, we shared the updated draft with Cynthia and Rebecca. And only after their review did we finalize the report and share it with the Space Steering Committee. Now, there is one more step in this process I want to mention that to really closing out the project. It was a joint discussion among participants. And I think this last step really kind of shows the leadership savvy of Rebecca and Cynthia. They pulled everyone together after they had a chance to see the final report and to talk about their experience and, and provide feedback to us as researchers. So this was a, a real nice close to the project. Um, our participants had a chance to discuss everything that had happened to that point. Um, and, and we received the valuable feedback that people felt heard and that the report accurately reflected the interview discussions. Um, and we learned what participants hoped would be done with this as a result will be done as a result of the report. And, and as researchers, we felt like we had fulfilled our role in identifying the challenges, or excuse me, the changes um, that would improve the spaces from an outside objective perspective, which is what, what our original aim. And by providing recommendations for improving related processes, we feel that if these are implemented, we can help smooth out the pro future processes some by helping to better equip leaders in leading these processes. And by implementing a customized building and use assessment instrument, we have the potential to measure spaces granularly to identify the kinds of things that um, personnel prefer to what they don't. And we can also use it to push for more equitable spaces for all personnel. And so as a follow-up to this study, we, we now have a graduate assistant that's act actively developing um, that building and use instrument. And I'll pass it back over to Rebecca. Thanks, Steve. So as Steve mentioned, uh, right around the time we had all been in the spaces for about six months and about the time we were moving to the middle of this assessment project that we were doing, uh, we were all sent home. So the new workspaces that we had and that we were trying to adjust to suddenly became completely obsolete. Not the spaces themselves, but everything that we were trying to do and think about it. So I have a headline here from one of many articles that was written about this topic. Has COVID-19 destroyed the open office? Well, I think it's pretty clear that we're never going to use the space the way it was intended ever again. Um, currently, we are thinking <laughs> about what back to in-person work looks like. Um, in terms of these two open office spaces, we're thinking about things like what does scheduling for capacity in these spaces look like because all of us will not all be able to be in this space ever again. Um, we're thinking about refining the spaces for health and safety um, and just thinking about additional things we can do now that we all have an additional public health consideration that really wasn't a consideration when we were building the space. Um, we have had unclear so far guidance from the university on what flexible work arrangements are going to look like once we're all asked to come back in person. Um, as you could probably tell from Cynthia, Steve, and myself, we're all still working from home um, at Penn State. Um, a number of our colleagues are on site, but um, a lot of us who are able to are still working from home. Um, and we're also getting, at, at this point, again, there's so little known, just unclear directions from our space steering committee um, about what might be possible in terms of refining the spaces. So we have a couple of discussion questions that we were gonna throw out to the group, um, but I think we wanna make sure we have time to hear your questions as well. So let's do this. I see a couple questions coming in from the Q&A. Um, let's respond to those. And then if we have time, um, we'll throw out our discussion questions and generate some conversation among everyone here today. And it looks like uh, our moderator has turned on her camera to <laughs> ask us the questions. Yes, we have a few questions. Um, the first one um, is from Anonymous. I'm really compelled by the fact that your upper administration was supportive of this internal research study to deal with low morale. How did you get admin support to work with campus experts and perform this assessment? Oh, that's a good question. I'll start and then I will invite Cynthia to jump in as well. Um, 
I feel like one of my general leadership strategies is to ask forgiveness rather than permission. So I think I just, we just did some of them rather than getting permission. Um, but I will say that our administration, we did communicate, we were doing this, we did talk about it with them. Um, I mentioned on one of my slides that a lot of people who weren't directly impacted by our spaces were also really upset about the open office space because of course, everyone then starts to think like, is this the future in the libraries? Are we all going to have open office spaces? So I think our administration realized that there needed to be some larger scale change management happening. And um, I think they were they were happy that we were seeking out expert help um, to advance some of that change management. Cynthia, do you have additional thoughts to throw in there? Uh, no, I think you summed it up nicely. All right, so second question. Um, I'm really compelled. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, so what advice would you give to a middle manager who needs to advocate to change a low morale environment on their team that is caused by administrative decisions such as gaslighting, favoritism, or targeting? Would a self-report of the department led by the middle manager be worthwhile? That is a really tough one. And I feel like it gets to a lot of the systemic pieces of low morale in general. I saw Steve turn on his camera. Maybe he has some thoughts on this. Yes, this, is, this isn't an easy question. And I, um, I'm shooting from the hip here. Uh, I think it in part is gonna depend on the structure of your organization. Um, I don't know that I would recommend that the middle manager themselves do this investigation. If, if you have a unit like uh, an assessment unit or a third party unit who could come in and kind of lead, lead it, I would suggest that. And I would also even recommend going out to your Office of Planning and Institutional Research. A lot of times um, in organizations where you don't have uh, a support like, like the unit that I lead, um, institutional research and planning, they often fulfill that role. So I would recommend um, bringing in an outside facilitator for some of this. Okay. Um, and then our next question, and we also have a few questions or statements in the comments. Um, what has worked in bringing people from endings to beginnings? Uh, we're having a construction project imposed on us by the campus president during our absence from campus due to COVID-19, and it's caught all the employees off guard and damaged morale. Um, this is on top of another construction project where info wasn't shared or was shared asymmetrically. Ooh, that is a tough situation. My heart goes out to you, whoever, <laughs> whoever that is. And I, I think there are elements of that that we deeply empathize with. Um, in terms of bringing people along from that endings to beginnings phase, we were sort of interrupted in the middle. I felt like we were potentially moving forward with that transition. Um, but we were really only in the space for about six months. We were maybe moving toward that middle box at that point. Um, I think one of the biggest things that would have helped us would be time. Um, people need time and space to adjust, to figure out what new workflows and relationships and collaborations will look like. Uh, I will say that a lot of the ideas that the change management consultant gave us really helped, um, for example, she encouraged us to develop community agreements, um, which I think both of our departments had had something like that already, but the community agreements really outlined um, what we expected from each other in the office space, what really annoyed some people uh, so that we could try to avoid that, what people really needed to be able to work well in the space, and that we had bi-weekly check-ins on that just to see how things were going to really be intentional about thinking about the fact that we were going through a transition. Um, Cynthia, would you add anything to that? Sorry, I'm distracted by chat. Um, I think I think you so you you hit on it well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump to the chat because I think there are a couple things in here that are kind of related. Um, so one of the comments is, so the open space was not a negotiable as a middle manager. It was presented fait accompli. Uh, lots of research out there says open spaces do not yield the theorized benefits, i.e. or e.g. greater collaboration and creativity. If anything, I've read more likely 
people more likely put on headphones and try to shut each other out. So a lot of our colleagues were very familiar with that research yeah. as well. And we definitely talk, talked a lot about that. And you're right, a lot of that research does exist. Um, but yes, it, it was an intentional decision by our architect and leadership. Cynthia looks like maybe she wants to say something here too. Um, yeah, I was just gonna add that um, most of the, re um, again, I joined the libraries at the point in which this, all of this, and I think Rebecca did too, at the point when decisions, these decisions were already made um, and the administrators who had made them had also moved on. Um, so we were all kind of dealing with the, a situation in which we didn't have all of the answers or all of the reasonings. Um, and um, a lot of, what we heard was that for Repub or for the part of Repub that was moving into this space, it was really a mechanism to launch the department as a, as a, as a key component within the libraries, but then also allow us, um, you know, that additional creativity and collaboration that is, that is meant to happen in an open office environment. And I will say, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't a bad experience for everyone. Um, Many people enjoyed com like coming in in the mornings and we would have chats and say good morning and have group lunches. And I mean, as far as building a community, it was definitely moving in that direction. Um, it's just, it, it was definitely, um, it, it's an effort or an ongoing effort. Sorry, did yeah. you want to add something, Rebecca? When you were talking about the reasons for the for our departments being selected for these spaces. One of the things I didn't mention at the beginning, um, just for time, was the fact that Library Learning Services, which is now a group of 13 people, had never been co-located. We were located in about seven different places in the library. So collaboration had always been a problem, just the opposite problem that we had um, once we moved into the office space. So. Um, you know, as the department head, I was excited about part of it because we had never all been in the same place. And sometimes a week would go by where I wouldn't see, you know, one of the people on the team just because our, our paths didn't cross. So as Cynthia said, there were elements that I really did enjoy about it. I loved seeing everybody every day. Um, but I also have to make sure I recognize that my job was very different than the other members of the team. They were doing very different work than I was. And in fact, everyone on the team has a unique position. He has different needs and different wants and different preferences for their work and their work environment. Um, and it really came down to it that we weren't able to honor those the way that I would like us to. Yeah. So another question, um, I'd love, to, well, more of a statement. I'd love to know some of the recommendations you're making to inform future space planning, if you can share any. Sure, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, now, these, these recommendations are really specific to our context, um, but uh, in, in our report, I think we had eight of them, and I'll just read, a, read them off real quickly. We want to we recommended incorporating the guiding principles from the Faculty Senate report. Um, those four elements are security, technology, privacy, and community. Uh, we recommend improving clarity in roles and expectations for everyone involved in the process, right? This is because it's generally outside of our domain. Um, we also recommend instituting the building and use evaluation that we discussed um, and to use that before and after each uh, space move. And as well as to ensure that stake, stakeholders' viewpoints are considered in the planning stage and implemented in the final design, right? I think there was, um, in this case, stakeholder views were considered in the planning stages, but they, they didn't feel, they didn't perceive them to be reflected in the, in the final product. Um, we also recommended consulting with units on campus to incorporate critical safety, security, and accessibility modifications during the design process. Um, it, it, from my understanding of the way this whole thing worked out, um, there were attempts made to improve on some of these things, but w until we knew that we needed to go to the right office to get the support, um, advocacy efforts just weren't going very far. Uh, we also recommend integrating, uh, right, for open air areas, right, integrating sound buffers and collaborative areas and, um, to, and anything you can do to minimize distractions. Uh, to incorporate communal spaces that are large enough to offer added flexibility uh, for employees. And, and this was a, a, one of the major 
differences between the spaces and the function of, of the spaces between LLS and Repub. Um, Repub really had um, some more additional spaces where they could move throughout the day and, and, and work in a more flexible manner the way these offices are intended to design. Um, another one was uh, department heads should consider their daily activities when deciding to forego an office. And this is one I don't know that we've discussed too much, but um, both Cynthia and Rebecca had decided to, to give up office spaces uh, so that they were living similarly to um, their reports. And there, there are implications for that because of how different the, their work is. Um, there's a lot more need for one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and that um, was discussed as um, resulting in um, one of those focus rooms being capitalized on uh, by the unit heads most of the time, right? So that diminished the availability of the flexible space for every, everybody else in the department. Uh, and so those were those are the eight recommendations we came up with. And if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share this report. Um, me, feel free to just write me directly. Okay. Um, any final questions? Yeah, just a comment saying that um, I think this could be helpful to other libraries that are going through the same thing and are struggling to figure it out. Um, plus ones, lots of love for Wilson. <laughs> so yeah, if they're making the mascot for the conference. Did you see that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and somebody suggests the Journal of Library Administration for publishing. So yeah, if there are no other questions, um, thank you so much for this presentation and for answering our questions. Um, it was a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so before we close the session, I'd like to point out that there is a survey available for you to um, fill out. Um, I'm certain the presenters would very much appreciate your feedback. Uh, so let me put that into chat before everybody goes. And you'll also receive this form um, in an email too. So yeah, don't forget that a recording for the session will be available after the conference. So thank you all for attending and we hope you enjoyed this presentation.